All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am. I, uh, we are here to talk about open hardware and COVID nineteen. Uh, I am. Oh, a little bit. I got that down. Um, I'm here with Allison Parker, who is my uh, my partner in crime on this one. Uh, she is from the Wilson Center Science and Technology Innovation Program. That is a think tank in Washington, D.C. that focuses on science, technology, and innovation. Uh, and I am from the Engelberg Center on Innovation Law and Policy at NYU Law, which does exactly what it sounds like at NYU. I'm also a longtime board member of the Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, Oshawa is a kind of community organization that acts as an umbrella organization for open source hardware and the open source hardware community. Uh, which will be relevant as we talk about how all these pieces fit together. So we're going to talk about open source hardware and COVID, but it seems to make sense to start with open source hardware and open source hardware. This is obviously a open source software crowd. You all know what's going on, how open source software works. So instead of explaining what open source hardware is from scratch, what I'm going to do is just highlight a couple of the differences between open source software and open source hardware. Now, importantly, open source hardware, very closely related to open source software, uh, directly comes out of the community. Most people, if not everyone in the open source hardware community is moving back and forth between open source hardware, and open source software. So focusing on these differences is not to suggest that there are massive differences between the two, but just instead to highlight where the differences are, because obviously when you port uh, norms, community norms, legal structures from software to hardware, uh, some things are going to change. And it's especially true because we've been doing open source hardware for over a decade. And so you're going to get it, you're going to see some uh, evolution uh, in certain directions. So I want to talk about three main differences between open source hardware and open source software. The first is a documentation. Open source software documentation, at least the base level of documentation, is pretty straightforward. Right. If you have the code and you have the license, you know a lot of what you need to know to understand whether or not the software is actually open source and potentially how it works. Now, obviously, there's a lot more documentation involved than just the code, but it's a good starting point. For hardware, the documentation situation is a little bit more complicated because there's just potentially more pieces involved in hardware. Right. There's the maybe some hardware schematics, some physical object build files, uh, potentially software as well. There's just a lot more going on with even the base levels of documentation when we're thinking about open source hardware. The second thing, and this is related to the documentation in a lot of ways, is the situation that hardware's relationship is to licensing. Now, open source software is born closed, right? The moment you write code, it is automatically protected by copyright for your lifetime plus 70 years in most places. And so if you want to share and you want to collaborate with people in software, you have to take affirmative steps and use a license to share and give everyone permission to work with your code. In a lot of cases, hardware is born open. That means it's not automatically protected by copyright law or any other intellectual property law. And as a result, you might not need to use a license or may not require a license to use someone else's hardware. Now, because there's so many moving pieces with hardware, that may not be true across the board, uh, but it's certainly true of part of it. And what that means is that the licenses are, are potentially more complicated, but may also not have as much power in open source hardware, especially if you want to impose copyleft obligations on users. Um, the third thing in open source hardware has to do with, with money. Um, open source software obviously has, a, has a, uh, a long relationship with finances and money. And a lot of that relationship is built around the idea that software is essentially free to make additional copies. With hardware, that's not the case, right? It costs money to, uh, to move bits around, or to, to move atoms around, to assemble them. And so there's a kind of level of comfort with financial transactions in, at the heart of open source hardware that I think differs a little bit from open source software. Now, this can be a little bit complicated to kind of map what is open hardware and what is not. And so one thing that Oshawa has done is created a free open hardware certification program. Uh, you can see that logo on the slide there to make it easy to understand if hardware 
actually matches the community definition and complies with the community definition. You can re read more about that and what you search around on it. Um, also, there is a certification directory if you want to get a better sense of all the things that are happening in open source hardware. So with open source hardware out of the way, I was talking about open source hardware and COVID. Uh, all of you know, we are in the middle of a COVID pandemic. All of you probably remember that, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a real acute shortage of hardware used to deal with COVID. Uh, most obviously that was PPE, personal protective equipment, but also things like ventilators and other kinds of equipment. The supply chain was not able to handle what was needed. Uh, there were real problems and shortages. And so what we saw was a huge community, uh, a distributed community standing up all over the world to say, well, we're gonna design and create and distribute and manufacture open source hardware to solve these COVID problems. And they worked together in an open way. So you saw the same kind of collaboration that you'd expect from open source software. We saw kind of people all over the world collaborating, finding the best solutions, working in an open and openly licensed way. And that meant that we got to iterate very quickly. We got to find solutions that worked for specific communities and also make sure that those communities could modify them as necessary. And that might be modifications based on the manufacturing equipment that they had, that might be modifications based on other needs within their community. Um, but all of these things were possible because of the openness of the process and the, the openness of everybody involved. Uh, this turned out to be real, a really effective response. We had people, you know, distributed design, distributed testing, distributed manufacturing, and distributed distribution to get to make this equipment where it was needed and to get this equipment to where it was needed. So this was in some ways very successful, um, especially because so much of the community essentially started from scratch, had to build their internal infrastructure as they were designing the hardware. So this is a big win. It's a big win for openness and a, a real success story. And so one of the things that the Engelberg Center and the Wilson Center did was get everyone involved together and work to document what actually happened, right? What, how did all these groups come together and how did they collaborate? And then also put together a package of recommendations for policymakers so policymakers could understand this is what happened basically without your support largely. Um, what can we do better to make this a more effective process in the future? So with that, I'll hand things over to Allison. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so I'm going to take it from here and, and talk a little bit about um, basically what we learned from this process of talking to a lot of people that were involved sort of at the ground level on the ground floor of, of the response to COVID-19 equipment shortages. Um, and we were looking to, you know, look at the implications of this approach to crisis response. And as Michael mentioned, offer some recommendations for policymakers. Um, and we thought that this was important both for sort of this particular pandemic response, but also for other types of crises and disasters where you might find a sort of grassroots um, decentralized distributed response um, to be essential, basically, when sort of the more top down processes fail. Um, and so we're really looking for opportunities to, you know, elevate the value of these sort of grassroots uh, approaches to um, developing in this case, the, the hardware needed for response, um, and think about uh, how they can be sort of be incorporated into the more top-down research and policy processes that we normally see. And of course, that's a, a tall order. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about sort of our main conclusions from this process. Um, and I'll start with what Michael mentioned as that this maybe wasn't as effective as it could have been. You know, there was like this tremendous potential um, and, um, and some success, and but maybe not as, as much as we could have seen. And so this was part of, part of the reason for this was sort of how open hardware was conceived in the broader landscape of sort of disaster response or um, supply chains, things like that. So um, because open hardware was not actually initially conceived as part of the response toolkit, we saw less coordination, of course, or, or not, not much coordination at all between um, sort of the um, the capacity of supplies that could come from more the traditional government side um, versus those that, that came from more grassroots communities. Um, and so without this strong admission of a need, 
or awareness of the potential response options, um, we didn't see a lot of uh, steps from the federal government to coordinate or amplify what was needed. And then we also saw a lot of challenges uh, on the grassroots side of coordinating and formalizing communities. Michael mentioned that the, a lot of the times these organizations were really starting from scratch. The organizations themselves were not necessarily starting from scratch. They were very well connected um, and had really great um, processes and procedures in place for what they were normally doing. But of course this required a shift. And a lot of times it required just building out um, and a much more, a much larger um, processes than they were uh, used to uh, handling. And then finally, and mainly, um, the communication and interfacing with authorities and with standards and regulations was a huge challenge. And so we think this serves as a really good case study for understanding how grassroots and ad hoc communities can interface with um, regulations, government authorities, et cetera, and all the various challenges of doing so. Um, and so within that, we saw that regulations that govern the use of manufacturing and the use of medical supplies in particular were not crafted with these ad hoc grassroots producers in mind, of course, um, and that these communities often did not have familiar familiarity with um, the necessary regulatory bodies or standards for producing medical equipment. Um, and there was just a lack of precedent for open source hardware communities um, to work with the, directly with the medical community and regulatory agencies. So with all of those challenges in mind, huge, huge challenges, um, the response to COVID-19 equipment shortages was truly remarkable. Um, we saw you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals across the country and around the world that um, really met this moment of need uh, with a lot of creativity um, and ingenuity. So we saw virtual networks come together, you know, some, some that existed already, some that didn't, um, to design, manufacture, and distribute those medical supplies. Um, we saw a lot of different uh, roles involved from engineers, medical professionals, logistics experts, regulatory specialists, all, all these people working together to design new equipment with the materials and equipment that we had that were available. When oftentimes the, um, the most obvious solution was not. Uh, and tapping manufacturing capacity uh, to produce this um, equipment uh, and supplies. And they found ways to distribute it to places with acute need. Um, so just a few examples of the success uh, uh, designs that were coordinated by U University Hospital Ventures were ended up being adopted by the state of Ohio as a standard of care. Make for COVID, which was an incredibly successful organization, um, delivered 120,000 units of PPE in six months, and a lot of that was to rural and children's hospitals and to the Navajo Nation. Uh, open source medical supplies uh, documented the creation of supplies and estimated that the value of all of that created was something around 268 million. And some volunteers at Helpful Engineering logged about 23 million hours of volunteer work. Um, and, and they estimated that that was worth something like 130 million. So this was a huge response. And um, Michael mentioned also that open hardware was particularly well suited for this situation. Um, we know that it can often be produced at a much lower price point than proprietary devices that are of similar quality. Um, and then we have many individuals with diverse expertise working on one problem um, through the open sharing and editing of design files. Um, we found that individuals were able to use digital fabrication tools to sort of adapt and customize production to meet what they saw as the particular need of their um, local environment or what they knew to be um, the most acute needs at the particular time. And then it was modular, so it allowed for efficient collaboration, um, particularly because um, various pieces and components could be creatively sourced from very distributed and diverse organizations. And so it was really um, inspiring. Um, next slide, Michael. Thanks. And then we also saw some interesting things happening at the government level. So we mentioned that there was not um, as much of a coordinated government response as we would have liked to see to make this a, a more effective uh, grassroots response and that the, the communication between more grassroots communities and um, federal, state, local uh, 
authorities was sometimes lacking. But we did see oftentimes um, career officials and employees within some agencies sort of act similarly to their grassroots counterparts. They actually set up some ad hoc interagency groups that were actually based on existing personal relationships. So we see throughout this the importance of um, relationships um, that were pre-existing and the ability to sort of shift those relationships to new needs. And these ad hoc groups recognized the need for in innovative tools. And a lot of times they worked sort of outside the scope of what of their day jobs or what they were um, supposed to, uh, uh, what they were also working on. So a lot of times this was, you know, sort of a night and weekend kind of thing for um, some of the people within uh, more, um, more of these top down organizations. And then we saw that contributors to sort of within government crowdsourcing efforts established networks with other government employees that were willing to think sort of, again, beyond the normal processes and procedures and initiate new ideas and partnerships um, to get to much needed solutions. And then we also saw some federal groups begin collaborating with intermediary and grassroots organizations like Open Source Medical Supplies, America Makes, Nation of Makers, a lot of the organizations we mentioned earlier. Um, and that many of these early conversations collaborators were will did and will continue to pave the way for more formal collaborations. And so all of this, um, especially more information about the, the particular organizations that were um, so hugely successful on the ground during that response, you can find in the report that Michael mentioned. Um, and I'll just mention that um, we appreciate you all listening and we're happy to um, answer questions if you want to get in touch with us at any point. Um, Michael mentioned I'm at the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center, and we're thinking a lot about how communities form around open source approaches and how they function, and then also how they contribute to various aspects of the conversation around open approaches to science. So anybody that's interested in that, I'm looking forward to the community session later today. Um, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, and also very interested in the role of policy in supporting open source. So. Lots of big conversations to be had there um, and really looking forward to um, connecting with any of you that are interested. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Allison and Michael. It's always, it's always really cool for me to see how community and collaboration is so much a part of other fields of human endeavor that are you know, making the world better in meaningful ways. So thank you for sharing your stories with us. Um, we, uh, we will now move on to our, our final keynote of the event. Um, Mark Shan from Tencent will be giving the final keynote. And uh, 